has brought us to the Perot Museum in Dallas, Texas. Today is all about dinosaurs. Let's read our book. The book of the day is I'm a T-Rex by Dennis Sheely. And with me today is Dr. Ron Tykoski, Director of Paleontology here at the Perot. He's going to help me make sure all the dinosaur words are accurate. I'll Thanks. Do my best. Thanks for being here with us, Dr. Ron. I'm going to take a specialized tour with Dr. Ron around the paleontology dinosaur exhibit here at the Perot. I am so excited to be here at the Perot Museum with none other than Dr. Ron Tykoski, Director of Paleontology here at the museum. Dr. Ron, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thanks for coming and visiting us. I'm glad to have you. You have so many wonderful specimens here. When we talk with the kids about dinosaurs, this is exactly what I think of. And can we just start with your beautiful T-Rex here? Yeah, this is, uh, of course, everyone knows Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's everybody's favorite. Yes. One of the most famous dinosaurs ever known. And, uh, and of course it is. I mean, look at the teeth and the thing, the claws. I mean, this is just straight out of people's nightmares or imagination. <laughs> kids love these. Anything with big claws and big teeth, kids just eat it up. Right out of the books. Yeah, like our book today. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so can you describe to the kids um, this particular T-Rex and we'll go and look at an actual bone over here that we have. So what we have up here is this is actually a cast of a Tyrannosaurus Rex that was yes. found back in the 90s. But it's a really accurate cast. We made the old-fashioned way. Uh, liquid rubber over the bones, peeling it off, filling with plastic. Because not a lot of museums like to give up their Tyrannosaurus Rexes and give them out to other people for free. So yes. they'll make lots of copies. And that's what we have here. And that allows us to mount this thing in a really active, like, hey, I'm alive looking sort of scene. Like it's about to bite this other animal in the elbow here. <laughs> so, um, so there are a good number of really good Tyrannosaurus Rex skeletons known now, and we just have this one right here that is wanted to have a really dynamic scene of it, looking like it's active, not just, I am just standing still. You know, we wanted it to look energetic and alive almost there. I love this. And let's take a look at this actual leg of a T-Rex. So these, when you're looking at down here, these are the foot bones, so kind of the sole of your foot between mm -hmm. where your toes would be and the ankle. The ankle would be here. Here, the sh that's the shin bone and little bone on the side. This is the knee end of it here. Ah. And this was actually found in Big Bend National Park several years ago. We collected it and mm -hmm. our preparers and folks in the lab, volunteers in the lab actually did a lot of work on cleaning this up, putting it all together, a lot of broken bits and pieces. We filled in the gaps. But this shows you that yeah, this these animals really did live right here in Texas, as yes. far west Texas. Now this is so cool, even though this is a cast, like this is an actual dinosaur bone. This is what all the kids just love and think about. When you talk about paleontology, it's the bones, gotta dig up the bones. And we know that's important, that's one of the reasons why we try to put as many of the real things out here for people to see as possible. We can't always do that. Right. There aren't enough of them to go around. But boy, we try to get the real things out as much as you can. Absolutely. Now, uh, can we walk around and uh, you kind of tell us a little about this massive one in the background, <laughs> the tower is so tall. Absolutely. So here next to the Tyrannosaurus Rex is an animal that makes the Tyrannosaurus look a little puny. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Alamosaurus, a big sauropod dinosaur, and these long neck, long tail plant eaters. Uh, also, plenty of its bones known from Big Bend National Park. Uh, I mean, really, this is really not even a contest here. Probably in real life, a full-grown Tyrannosaurus Rex would not mess around with a full-grown Alamosaurus. We're talking about a seven-ton predator messing with a 30-ton plant eater. Wow. This is probably not going to go real well for the Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's a, it's a little outclassed. So. Yes. But uh, the real neck bones of this cast here, this big copy of Alamosaurus, are over here on exhibit. Those are the real things here. And they're about the only spot you can see these real neck bones on exhibit anywhere in the world right now. Uh, took us a years to clean these all up. They were in huge blocks that had to be picked out of the park using a helicopter out to a big truck. Uh, the big ones down the end, even today, weigh probably 700 pounds. And so, uh, in life, they actually live in like your size. It's actually sort of like, uh, kind of built like big cheese puffs. You look at them on the inside, they're all spongy yeah. and frothy on the inside. So they actually were probably pretty lightweight for their size. But now all that empty airspace has been filled with minerals and rock and so on. Okay. 
Is but, that how they're, are they supported specially for this display? Yeah, that's actually exactly the way they were found in the ground. Still connected all the brakes, we just reconnected all the brakes just as they were. So that's what somebody found in the ground in Big Ben back in the late 1990s. Oh, wow. So that's the real deal. <gasps> Those are the real bones. See how frothy the bone is? Yes. Here's actually a broken part here. A little hard to see in this light, but it is like a sponge on the inside. And these big cavities in the side would have yes. been big air sacs. Think of them like, oh. like almost like balloons of tissue yes. filled with air and stuff as animals breathing back and forth. They would fill these spaces around here. Just like what you see on a modern day bird. Ah. So there's the connection, that bird dinosaur connection. Even a big animal like that had the sort of air sac system up and down the neck and other parts of the body that you can see in any bird alive today. And then huge muscles, big ligaments would have stretched between these big neural spines here on the top, going down there to help hold that massive neck up. Oh, that would take so much to hold. Oh, it's it's huge. Yeah, I mean, I mean, think about how tired your neck gets from mm -hmm. sitting on a computer all day or whatever. Imagine if your neck was 25 feet long. Oh. You know, so. And it's hard to believe that this is a plant-eating dinosaur, a herbivore. Yeah, so you're huge. That's your defense. How do you yes. how do you survive against an animal like that Tyrannosaurus over there? You get big. You try to grow big fast. <laughs> you know, they probably grew about as fast as a modern-day elephant. Take a look at it. So, and, you know, baby elephants are easy prey for lions yes. and other predators in the environment. Small, any big sauropod started out as a little sauropod. Yes. And so they would have been vulnerable to things like Tyrannosaurus, but by the time you got to like that size, the Tyrannosaurus, much like a lion won't mess with a grown up elephant, mm -hmm. Tyrannosaurus Rex probably wouldn't mess with a grown up Allosaurus. Oh, no, yeah. Until it got old, sick, mm -hmm. injured, or weak. And there, it's interesting. Um, one of the specimens of this Alamosaurus that made this Alamosaurus, when they were digging it up, they actually found Tyrannosaur teeth around the bones. Oh. So at some point, probably that that Alamosaurus was a meal for Tyrannosaurus after that. Oh. So. Um, is there a T. Rex like a full skeleton? I know you mentioned this is a cast in the world. Oh yeah, there's pretty darn complete skeleton. Now you almost never find a complete skeleton of anything. There's a lot that has to go into play in order to get complete preservation of anything. Okay. And so even if you look around this room, we do have lots of skeletons that have the real bone in them, but almost none of them have are all 100%. Mother Nature doesn't work with us very well sometimes. So we'll have substantial chunks that are the real thing, other parts missing. Probably the best Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton in the world are around 90%. Okay, that's pretty, so, yeah. pretty good. That's pretty darn <laughs> impressive, yeah. Uh, I think the one that this is based off of, boy, I forget, it's probably more like around 50, 60%. I uh -huh. have to check that, to be sure. But what's interesting, this one's based off the first Tyrannosaurus Rex that was found with a complete arm. Oh. Up to then, we sort of guessed based off of related Tyrannosaurus, but sure. this one, the arm, is actually the first one to really show us what the anatomy of a Tyrannosaurus Rex is. But let's face it, people like me fun with their arms. They will. You have the big teeth. I'm really tough. Little big teeth. Exactly. So, um, but it turns out when studies are done on there, there's some really big muscle attachments on there. Those were not just little little chicken wings out there. These things had really large muscles, especially bison curls. I mean, some, I've seen some studies, early studies done on them suggested these things were like bicep curl by 400 pounds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is a Pachyrhinosaurus curl arm. Pachyrhinosaurus has been known for half a century, uh, but from rocks way further south in Canada. Mm -hmm. And they're notable because instead of having these horns over their eyebrows and big horn on their nose, they got rid of those and instead have a battering ram on their face. Ah. So if you take a look at this skull here, I'm going to hop right up here to uh, point it out. If you take a look at the skull here, here's the eye, roughly. Here's the nose, nostril. The fleshy nostril would be here, but this would be a big flappy thing like you see on a horse. Uh -huh. The teeth would be here, the lower jaw would be here. They have a rounded beak, which is weird. But instead of horns over the eyes and on the nose, this. This big 
swollen, bulging mass, which would have had a big, thick layer of horn over it. Not like a rhinoceros horn. Sure. More like battering ram horn you see on like a, a musk ox. Okay. Or an African buffalo today. The... You know, they mm -hmm. just bash together for them. Probably yes. was a really ugly animal. <laughs> big, lumpy, warty, nasty <laughs> face on this thing. Uh, and then it would have had a frill with horns and things decorating it. And that's what we reconstruct here on a pack rhinosaur's body. So that's a copy of this skull right there. This animal lived in the Arctic. Wow. Herds of these animals. We have a quarry here where we got the remains of at least 12 or 15 of them all mixed in together. Uh, all the bones and bits and pieces are all stirred together. It's a real mess. Very difficult to prepare it out. But this is a herd of animals that all died in one place. Or many of them died in one place and got washed in and buried together. Mm -hmm. And where you have plant eating animals, you usually have meat eating animals. Yes. When I was cleaning this skull up, I found a tyrannosaur tooth sitting right here. Still embedded in the rock right next to it. It looks like one probably somebody was scavenging a meal and took a bite and ripped it. Tooth popped out, you know. Everyone's had teeth fall out. It's dead in there. They popped out a tooth and it landed in the mud and was preserved here. Wow. So for a long time we didn't know who that belonged to yes. until we finally found three or four bones of who it belonged to. And it turns out it's a brand new species of Tyrannosaur. We named it in 2014. Oh, Anuxaurus Hoaglundi, uh -huh. and there's a copy of a reconstruction of what we think it might have looked like sitting up on top of our fossil lab. Oh, and that's that? a full-grown adult. Whoa. It's a pint-sized Tyrannosaur. I was going to say, it looks almost like just a mini T-Rex. Yep. If I was standing up there, it's uh, I would be about as tall as its hips. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. So, it's, uh, as far as we know, well, that's an adult. So that's weird. we got an animal living on our slope which is a tyrannosaur, but it, instead of being seven tons and 40 feet long, it's 25 feet long and 800,000 pounds, 1,500, kind of a runt. Yeah, com comparatively speaking yeah, compared to, to that, the over there, big yeah. boys over there. Yeah. So we think maybe that's uh, an adaptation for having li being alive living in this bizarre environment. Um, you had mentioned that this is an actual yeah. head. Yeah, that's the real fossil. This is the real deal. Uh, is this the eye socket? That's where the socket would be. Uh, I'm, that's a just a piece of bone that wound up floating in there. There were a hundred other bones all surrounding the skull when I was prepping it out. There was actually a leg bone shoved up its nose when I first found it. First cleaning it off, and vertebrae all over and ribs crisscrossing it. And so uh, first thing you have to do is get all those off. Uh -huh. And then you look at all these little cracks. Each one of those is a break. This thing was shattered into a thousand or more pieces. And so it took four years to extract this from the rock and reassemble this into what you see in front of you today. It pays off to be patient if you're a paleontologist. That is a great point. Also, if you're really good at jigsaw lessons. If you're not when you start, you are by the time you finish. So, how do you, man, how do you even take something from the ground like that and put it back together again? Well, that fascinates me. It takes a lot of effort. Uh -huh. It takes uh, some rock hammers, some chisels, some big eggs. It takes a plaster. Uh, you will wrap this thing up in the ground. It'll, you'll leave it in the rock and wrap it up in a plaster field jacket. Kind of like if you've ever broken a bone, like sure. I did when I was three, and the doctor put a cast on my mm -hmm. Well, we put a cast around these things when they're in the ground, mm -hmm. let that harden up, and then we'll work on moving them. And then uh, that way we can transport it across the country, sure. across continents if need be. Absolutely. Bring it to a museum, bring it to a lab, or let it sit for a few years and open it when we have time and ability to get to it. Sure. Open it up, and then we can carefully go through it, remove the rock, put the pieces together. Some jobs are easier than others. You love it if you open up a jacket and there's this big beautiful bone and there's only a couple, two, three breaks, and the sediment is real soft and it's easy to scrape it off and all that. And then you deal with something like this, which is exactly the opposite. Yes. Yeah, but, uh, but you look at the payoff, you get at the end of it, this beautiful skull or partial skull. is a field jacket that has been opened, sawed open, saw, okay. made of burlap and plaster. Uh -huh. like, oh, this yes. is so neat to actually see it. And then, uh, and this has already had a lot of prep done on it. Most of the rock has actually already been removed. And what you're looking at is lots of shattered pieces of bone. Look at the cracks running through it and things like this. And we were having a rough time trying to figure out what this really was. And then I was in here last week and something caught my eye. 
this, believe it or not, this little oval shape right here caught my attention, and then this here, and suddenly realized what we were looking at, that is the back of a brain case. Mm. That is where the spinal cord enters the skull, or exits the skull, I should say. It comes from the brain and comes out to the rest of the body. This is a skull. There's a piece I just really? <laughs> Yeah, here's this, this part of this big uh, nasal boss, that big battering ram on its snout here uh -huh. in a gazillion pieces. And so all of that mess in there, you're looking at cross sections of broken bone, the inside of the skull of one of these animals all shattered up. Wow. So our fossil prep lab team is going to slowly take these pieces out. Mm -hmm. And the jigsaw puzzle begins. Wow. Take a piece out, clean it, set it down, take the next piece out, clean it, get to the first plate piece uh -huh. using some really good glue. Then the next one, then the next one, the next one, and eventually, if you keep doing that, you'll have less skull there and more skull over here, here. and you rebuild it pretty much from scratch. Wow, it would take a definitely a trained eye to take this to that. I mean, I'm looking at that just looking like it's a... Well, you're, a bunch of rock. You've only looked at it for a couple of minutes. Give yourself, a, you know, six months. You'll be able to tell the difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does a typical day look like for a paleontologist? Well, I'd like to say it's more glamorous than it is. <laughs> now, a, lot of, a lot of people are sitting down, reading, writing, looking at fossils, trying to figure out their anatomy. And then, can I write something about there? Is there something new about these things that people need to know about? Yes. And by people, I mean that scientific literature. Sure. So, I write papers telling people about the discoveries we find here, describing the anatomy, new things, occasionally naming new things, mm -hmm. and throw it out there, and those get published. Yes. If I'm it. <laughs> and, uh, and then, hey, what do you know? Then maybe that attracts other attention from other paleontologists and we can have a good discussion about these things. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I can spend my days doing that. I spend a lot of days going through our collections and reorganizing and doing a lot of re-identification of things. But I also supervise a team of fossil preparators here at the museum whose job it is to do this work. Because I can't describe anything. It's still like that. Yes. It's a mess. Yes. So we need specialists, and they are trained, skilled technicians who really have to have hands for it, have to have an eye for it, skills. Uh, like a surgeon. Like a surgeon, like an artist. Actually, some of the oh, best nice. fossil preparators are people who are very artistic. Oh, you can see the colors and the textures, and you've got the dexterity, the skills with your hands, and painting and sculpting and things like that. And you just have your, your mind wrapped around shapes and things like that. So it helps be creative. Mm -hmm. yes. So science isn't always just about numbers and cold artifacts and stuff like that. There is imagination. There's mm -hmm. Having sight, having a vision, having the skills, having creativity behind it as well. So, how do you take one of those little fragments that we saw in the lab and match it to the right dinosaur? Well, you know what? Sometimes there are certain parts of certain dinosaurs that only they have. Mm -hmm. So, if you take a look at the, there was a fragment in the lab there that had some ridges running across it. it turns out it looks a lot like these here and these here. So only Pachyrhinosaurus has that sort of feature in its skull. So as soon as you find a fragment of one of those, mm -hmm. and you see those ridges, you go, ah, that's a Pachyrhinosaurus bone. Okay, I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, other things, it's a little harder. You, know, you find a rib bone, yeah. you know, ribs, pretty much a rib. It could be a rib of that. Sure. It could be a rib of Nanosaurus, for all I know. Uh -huh. uh, especially if it's a little fragment of a rib. I can just say, well, it's a dinosaur rib bone yes. fragment. And that's about as far as I can take. Yes. What was your inspiration for becoming a paleontologist? What was my inspiration? My inspiration was that I was a little kid. And every little kid seems like they go through a dinosaur phase yes. in life. I never got out of mine. <laughs> right, so everybody else grew up and you know thought of real careers and real things and whatever and got interested in other other stuff, especially as you get in your teenage years. Sure. But for whatever reason, I actually got pretty well sucked into it and decided pretty early on I wanted to be a paleontologist. And luckily, I had parents who really helped me out with that and who really said, you can do anything you want. You can be anything you want to be if you work hard enough for it. And uh, you know what? That's a pretty powerful message to send to a kid. And that's what I found. And so the opportunities came up. Uh, worked really hard in school. Got the grades necessary to get into the places I needed to go to get my hands on fossils on a regular basis. Yes. And many years later, and a whole lot of schoolwork later, here I am. Wow. What would you tell children 
aspiring to be a paleontologist today, what, what would you tell them? If you're gonna be a paleontologist, get ready to do a lot of reading, spend a lot of time in school, learn about the world, about the natural world, learn about how the earth works, learn about geology, geologic processes, learn about life processes, learn about anatomy. You don't have to be interested in dinosaurs, maybe you're interested in sponges or starfish. Then go out and learn everything you can about sponges and starfish if that's what inspires you. Uh, do a lot of reading and uh, like I said, just be prepared to spend a lot of time in school. One thing I, I've talked to lots of school groups over the years and it always blows their minds when they ask me, how long did you have to be in school to do this? And I said, well, if you count from first grade, you know, first grade to 12th grade, there's 12 years, and then I spent five years as an undergrad, well, that's 17, and then another 10 years getting a master's and a PhD, you know, it's like I spent 27 years in school. And their eyes get real big and their jaws drop, and suddenly probably most of them go, uh-uh, I'm out. But yeah, you're gonna spend a lot of time in school, but if this is really what you wanna do, Time goes by really fast because you're studying what you want. You're doing what you want. And that makes it really easy to get up and go to work the next day. When you get up and get to go do exactly what you've always wanted to do. No oh, yeah. Well thank you so much for being here today. It has been a, Thanks for coming. a pleasure. This museum is amazing. Thank you so much for watching this book day episode. I hope that you've enjoyed this world of dinosaurs today. And be sure to subscribe that you don't miss any of our upcoming adventures. We'll see you soon. Bye. Want more book days? Well, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming adventures. Here are some other options that you may enjoy.